Hi everyone, welcome to the Befores and Afters podcast. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters. Today we're chatting to Milk VFX about the film Me Time, and specifically the mountain lion sequence in that film, in which Kevin Hart's character happens to run into a mountain lion and its cub in the desert. You'll hear from several members of the team at Milk about crafting that CG lion and cub, which was overseen by VFX supervisor Kieran Crowley. On the podcast are Neil Roach, head of 3D at Milk, Hirsch Bora, character animation and face replacement specialist at Milk, Chris Hutchison, head of animation at Milk, Kevin San, lead texture artist at Milk, Bastian Mortaleku, lighting and look dev TD at Milk, and Jorge Oliver, 2D supervisor at Milk. Let's jump into that conversation now. I started by asking Neil Roach what Milk's brief was for the mountain lion and cub sequence. Um, so the brief was, uh, we knew this was like quite a long sequence in the film where um, the, one of our main characters, Kevin Hart, would, he was um, kind of like stranded, not stranded, but he's, yeah, we stranded in the desert and he decides to go off and wander off and, and do a, like a poo, in a, like a porter <laughs> poo, poo bucket. And then he disturbs like a mountain lion cub and he sees a mountain lion cub on the floor and then he picks him up and then the mother mountain lion then comes along and this sort of instigates like a really long chase down the mountainside where then the mountain lion ends up fighting with Kevin Hart. He then stabs the mountain lion with an adrenaline pen and this is what kind of like stops the mountain lion from killing him. Then the mountain lion wanders off with the, with the cub. So it was... I think the reason why it was so exciting for us was because it, it was like 40, originally bid at like 40, 50 shots. So sometimes when we're doing creature stuff, you can kind of get the you know, 10 shots, creature turns up, runs and then dies, or creature turns up, runs and goes away. But I think we thought with a 50 shot sequence like this, we could really get some character into the mountain line and also the cub. So I think that was really why we really wanted to do this sequence uh, and I felt that it would be good for us to do because we obviously like doing a lot of creature work at the company um, and I think it, it was going to be really challenging to do a fully muscle sins, fully groomed uh, mountain lion photo reel as well. They didn't want any anthropomorphizing. They wanted it to be photo reel, act like a real mountain lion. Um, so I think it was just kind of making sure we hit that level of like photo reel, making the animation look amazing. Um, and also the other challenge was the integration into how the mountain lion would fight with Kevin Hart. Cause obviously we had to do, um, they shot a lot of stuff on set where he was holding like a blue stuffy and we had to then make it look convincing and, and in, really integrate the, the mountain lion into the plates. And there was a lot of, it was quite a slapstick part of the sequence as well. Cause he like rolled properly rolls down the hill and then he gets clotheslined by the, the lion so uh and then the other thing was hitting the comedic beats because we had to you know it's a comedy film so we've got to make sure we hit the get the timing right hit the beats um so the audience can respond to the film as they should do and neil you also mentioned like milk's done some great character work recently and i think it's particularly impressive because you're a relatively small company compared to some of the much bigger ones what what have what have you been doing pipeline wise or tools wise, or even set up in terms of artists there in recent shows uh, that let you do this very um, conveniently? I mean, we've got, we've got uh, Ziva uh, very well integrated into pipeline for muscle fat and skin simulations. Uh, Yeti is the software we use for groomed, which again is really well pipelined. Um, which means we don't once the once the muscle sims uh, are set up and the groom scenes are set up, it's really quick for us to iterate on these shots overnight on the farm because everything goes on the farm. And so you can do an animation, publish it in the evening, it gets put on the farm, and then the next morning you you'll come back and you'll have a daily which will have the muscle simulations on it and also the groom simulation. So. It's uh, a really nice, efficient way to QC the work before it goes into light as well. It means we're not wasting time on stuff that it looks wrong. And also it's great for the animators because then they can make sure that they're animating realistically within the constraints of how a, how, how a mountain lion would move. And, you know, the best way of, of understanding that is when you do a muscle sim and all the muscles go all over the place or it's moving too fast, then you can tailor it, uh, like sort of uh, dial it back. So 
Um, I think that side of things, I know we've got a really good team here. It, it, it's, we, we collaborate really well on creatures as well, um, between uh, model, texture, look, dev, animation. So there's a lot of, um, we're doing a lot of stuff in tandem and a lot of feedback going um, between the departments, which is, is really efficient and it kind of makes us, it, it helps us push the product to like a better level. Mm. Let's talk about the build. Um, coming to you, Hirsch, as lead modeler, what were some of the first challenges you thought um, you know, you'd face and your, the team would face um, modeling a mountain lion? And we should also say a cub here as well. Um, but, you know, it's not always that easy modeling a quadruped um, and dealing with, you know, a very agile creature like this. No, absolutely. Um, see, there's two ways to tackle doing a creature like that. First is you don't, you have, you get a lot of references. And I come from experience of another place where we did a lot of like lions recently. And what we did there was, you know, we didn't really have a cost of a lion. So when you have a cost of an animal, you know, it's it's much easier or not much easier, but it's, we, we have a very focus of like, this is the animal, this is what it looks like, and this is what we have to build. So on this project, the, the advantage was we actually had a cost of a lion, of a mountain lion, and we knew this is what we have to build. And that was the key. Uh, on the other show that, that I mentioned, you know, we generally built, we took a lot of different pictures and we just had to build a lion, you know. And the problem with that is when you don't have a specific uh, reference of one, uh, you know, creature to build, uh, especially when we are building a realistic creature, is then you know it's almost like saying, can we build a digital human which which looks like Kevin and you know Chris? It's the same thing with animals. You know, every animal has a different sort of uh, proportion of the face, of the eyes, of the body. So that was the first phase. We actually had a reference of a mountain lion that we had to match, which was great. So we had a photogrammetry which we used for it. So that that was the key. You know, I mean, it's it's. It's good, it's easier because we know what we have to match, but it's also harder because we, we have the reference in depth that we can, you know, always check back to. So, you know, it's, it's back and basically going back and forth. Mm. So the first phase was to take the photogrammetry of the animal then take our topology and match to it and then take, but because the thing is with the photogrammetry, the issue is it comes with a fur. And what we're doing with, for the build for our, uh, you know, the 3D model is we have to take the fur out. So that's the first phase. The first phase is we match the model in the pose of the, or, or you know, the photogrammetry, uh, 100%, one to one. We show it to the supervisors, they say, yep, that looks like the animal, can't see the difference. Then the second phase is we take the groom out and then we sort of build uh, realistically looking at the anatomy and everything, uh, what the animal would be inside the fur. The tricky part is we would never see what the animal looks like without the fur, right? Because there's no reference for it. So we just have to sort of look at the anatomical drawings. We need to know how the skin sort of looks, how much muscle. That's where you have a bit of a creative leeway of doing a bit of sculpting. But uh, yeah, that's the second phase of it. And, and is that where Ziva comes in as a tool to assist with that? Or is you mostly using that more for muscle sims? Uh, Ziva comes much later down the pipe. Right. So first, first phase, like I said, when we take the groom out, that's more like a sculpting sort of from memory references and sort of imagining where the elbow is, where the shoulder is, where the, you know, the four, forearm muscles are, or where the rib cage is. So that's, that's sort of like a creative sculpting process. You can sort of see a little bit of references on the real life photo that we've taken of the photogrammetry and also the scan. So we sort of gives an idea of where to sculpt those things. So that's the first phase. We sculpt that, we do a model, we make a neutral model of it. And then at that point, either we do a bit of a topology work or, you know, we, we try and reuse the topology which we already have, but, you know, that always changes with depending on which animal it is. So we do the topology work. And then once that's done, that can go either to rigging and animation and they can start doing their thing. And then it can go to the Ziva muscles. Right. Uh, well, we also have to do a pass of the muscle build. So what modelers would also do is once we've done the sculpts, and you know it's 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 gone to groom, it's gone to texturing, and all that stuff is happening. We're also building muscles, which are more accurate, and that's what's going to go to Ziva. And then there's another pass where Ziva, once it's gone to Ziva, and uh, the skin wraps onto it, and then there there's a bit of a correction we have to do on the original sculpt we did based on what the muscle is doing. Great, uh, Chris, coming to you in terms of animation, I, I'm really curious about that interaction that happens with rigging and animation 
given that you have to get a performance out of this mountain lion? Tell me about that. Yeah, I think that's what's the, the fascinating part is that, you know, there's a lot of uh, internal stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Like we will get a first pass of the rig and, and we'll give it a good MOT, like uh, just see that everything's moving correctly. Um, and then obviously that gets presented to the client and he can then see what, you know, what is working and what isn't. But in between all that, you know, these discussions between rigging, me, Hirsch, you know, even internally, there was like, I think hours of meetings where we were just talking about, <clears throat> you know, how how like the the nose might move or things you know every, every little detail we kind of cover that we're trying to anticipate for the final performance so we're trying to make sure that it can hit all the right beats for what it needs to for the story and, and what the character performance needs to be so um yeah it's uh it's awesome i, I know i love it i think it's it's really fun getting something like this and, and it's a real good challenge um as well uh, with, with, with everything needs to be done. There's so many intricacies that go with it and there's so many uh, teams that work concurrently with each other to get the final final product that we mm. see. So it's not just like, here's the rig, you're finished, you can get started now. It's always like, well, here's rig version one. It's like, okay, that's great, I can get started. But then all of a sudden, this opens up a world of possibilities for everything else. So there's, there's so many other things that come up there. And, and I don't know, I don't ever think the rig's ever fully finished, in my opinion. I think there's always room for improvement, but... You know, we, we've got a deadline, we have to get stuff done, and it's uh, as long as it gives us the performance and the movement that we need, then, you know, it, it's solved. So. And and how much uh, animation reference or live action, live footage reference of Mountain Lions have you watched in the past couple of months? Uh, well, thank God for uh, YouTube and being able to watch everything at two times speed because, uh, you know, I can just watch loads of documentaries and, and as much uh, reference as possible and, uh, originally, when I went through, uh, we had like a, a post to kind of roughly work with. But um, what I did is I just went through as much reference as I could uh, with anything, you know, like stuff that I was finding on uh, Instagram with, with videos or, you know, anything that's kind of relatable to the big cat. Um, but, you know, I was trying to find any and all reference of mountain lions, you know, and, and mountain lions are named so differently in different parts of the world. You know, you get like the, the puma and the cougar and it's essentially the same roughly the same creature, but I didn't want to be looking at references of like a lion, for example, or a cat, because then, you know, the weighting and the size and the scale and the mass is all going to feel wrong. So I wanted to make it feel as grounded as possible, even though it's meant to be a, a comical world. So I watched, yeah, probably far too much uh, YouTube videos. Um, but the good thing is, yeah, we had the rough posters to begin with. And then what I did even before animating was I found all the reference that I thought would work. Uh, and so I kind of cut it up into like a little edit of just the reference I found and we presented that to the client, which was, you know, it, it's a good talking point. It's kind of like what Hirsch was saying with the reference of the uh, the model. It, it, all of a sudden they could visually see what we were going to do, the level we wanted to achieve. And uh, I mean, we were speaking the same language. It kind of gets rid of the uh, subjectivity out of it. And then all of a sudden it's like, great, yeah, I can see the right leg or it would move like this or the tail does go like this or, or whatnot. So, um, yeah, so... As much reference as possible was was watched, but uh, if I had to boil it down to hours, yeah, probably, I don't know, a few hundred. <laughs> I might come back to you and ask about some of the more comical animation moments, like throwing away of the cub and the tussle. Um, okay. But uh, just to continue with the build process, I suppose, um, Kevin, coming to you as lead texture artist... Um, I thought the mountain lion looked beautiful. What were the particular texturing challenges that you faced here? Right. So with what Neil said about the brief, we're, we're looking for a realistic uh, mountain lion. And as Hirsch mentioned, again, we used an actual casted mountain lion to see what the proportions were or what the, what the colors were of this particular mountain lion. So we had a photo scan uh, of the mountain lion in the, the studio. So we had 360-degree uh, photography of this, of this uh, animal, and all of these photos had to be uh, neutralized. So we'd get the accurate color information of what the fur looks like, what the eye looks like. And the exercise in this case is just pure observation. Like the, the mountain lion is a beautiful creature. So as long as we could replicate the, uh, the same characteristics of the mountain lion casting the show, then as a texture artist, matching those colors and uh, materials, like for the eye, for the, how, how the fur looks, how matted it looks, is uh, it's pretty much 
our mandate. So the challenge of getting the exact colors, well, let's say the fur, uh, you had to go through a groom process. So Matt Bell, who's not in this call, he's the lead groomer who would uh, set the directionality of the fur, the length, etc. And for textures, we would make two color maps. So we'll make like fur tip color and fur root color. And it's up to look there. So you can see how collaborative this whole process is. So Bastion's, he'll chime in in a second. But uh, I would have to set two different colors for the fur. And in the look there stage, we would have a shader that would um, explicitly use one map for the root for the base of the fur and then the fur tip color for the tip. And it's all about setting the two determine the root color and the tip color is a ramp shader. So between values of one to zero to one, you set how far the root goes and how far the tip goes. So the, to, to ch the challenge of getting the, the fur to look as realistic as possible is a, a constant feedback cycle of me texturing the maps, the two different maps, and then going to the look that uh, seen to render a still frame and it's just going backwards and forwards and also showing these reports to the daily sessions and even if i'm not showing these images in daily sessions i will just chime into my fellow artists like animation uh hership uh, modeling i'll just say, i'll just swing by their desk and say what do you think of these colors how uh, where do you think i could improve on this so i would always rely on my peers to help me get a better uh, result. So I think the whole challenge is use, observing the photography and constantly doing revisions to improve the, uh, the assets. And what, what tools do you tend to rely on in texturing? And what, what did you rely on here for the mountain lion and cub? Uh, I just relied on Mari. Uh, that's pretty much it. So, Mark, so we use Mari for texturing and we use Arnold's in Maya for rendering. Awesome. And you mentioned obviously Bastion's work there in terms of him being the lead look dev and lighting artist. So I'm going to come to you now, Bastion. Um, I, it's actually a really great theme from just talking to a whole bunch of people here in one go is the collaboration. You know, I don't always get a chance to talk to so many people about one project. So I like hearing that it needs to, you know, move around the pipeline really to obviously become the final um, piece of visual effects work. Bastian, can you talk about that a little bit about what you, at what stage you get involved and how you interact with the other people? Yeah, so um, I was actually quite lucky because um, uh, we started to do a look depth quite early. So yeah, basically, uh, once we got a first pass of room, I could already start uh, doing the look dev and play a bit with the shaders and the, the lighting as well, because the, the, the lighting was quite specific. Um, it was like only in one place in a really sunny day with a strong, um, yeah, sun key, basically key light. So yeah, we, we had to manage and uh, make sure but it was actually looking great and not burning too much uh, the color. So all those, all those stuff, yeah, it was a lot of um, processes uh, until we, we were happy for the final result. And as I, yeah, everyone mentioned, yeah, it was a lot of uh, back and forth, uh, especially with a texture artist, uh, groom, and uh, in look dev is always really important to have everything working uh, together um, everything is important um, modeling uh, sculpting as well because we use displacement to have all the fine details um, the groom of course is really important and i think for the lion we use uh, six different descriptions for the groom uh, because there are actually a lot of different um, uh, groom basically on the, the, the lion. Some of them are longer or thicker, so uh, all those kind of stuff I had to play with in Lugdev as well to make sure it was uh, looking great. 
And I agree, the lighting is so great. I mean, you've almost got nowhere to hide because it is that sort of harsh sunlight. And the mountain lion is kind of the same color as the rocks and that sort of thing, you know, that sort of seems tricky yeah. to me. What what were they able to do on set um, in terms of giving you any kind of lighting reference? Was it, did they have time to do typical gray ball, chrome ball type stuff? Yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of references. Uh, they did, yeah. Everything needed, we had basically, uh, so yeah, gray balls. Uh, we built different HDRI for the lighting. Yeah, I don't know how many we had, maybe 40 in total, but at the end we chose maybe four or five um, uh, for the lighting. And uh, yeah, it's really, really helpful for lighting artists to have a proper lighting. It's much easier um, to have a proper, yeah, and make sure that it's actually fitting in the, the shot. And uh, yeah, we did the same for the curve. Um, it was pretty much uh, the same process for the club we did for the mountain lion. Uh, we started with the mountain lion first. I think it was the, the main uh, thing. And uh, then once we were happy with the mountain lion, we jumped on the club. And uh, it was actually pretty fast to have a good result on the club once uh, we have everything yeah, ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. But yeah, it was really, really exciting um, because, yeah, we wanted to push uh, the realities really, really far and make sure we have a lot of details. Even we had close up shot, I think, on the face. So make sure that the eyes are working and it's always challenging uh, to make eyes um, real in CG. Uh, same for the mouth. We uh, model and texture everything inside the mouth. Uh, to have a nice teeth, uh, subsurface on the teeth, on the tongue. Um, uh, even on the tongue, yeah, we had a lot of details and displacements. Uh, so, yeah. Um, yeah, it was exciting. <laughs> it works so well for that, like, leaping at camera shot, um, I seem to remember. Um, coming to you, Jorge, as comp soup, I I'm kind of asking each of the guys, I suppose, what their particular challenges were. I'm going to ask you the same thing. I feel like comp soups always tell me every shot is challenging and every part of it is challenging. But was there something about this because of lighting, but also the interaction with the actors, um, actor, that um, was particularly challenging more than maybe some other work that you've done? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, the, the part with Kevin Hart, the last part of the sequence was the, the more particular challenge for us. And there was also a lot of uh, cleanup involved because on set there was like a, we, there was an actor obviously dressed in blue as a, uh, to match the reference of the mountain lion for, for the guys to, to, to help match with the animation and, and, and all that. So we, we decided to, to obviously use Deep uh, to, to do all the comp because, and it helped us a lot, especially uh, in that final shots where, where, where we have so much interaction between uh, Kevin Hart and the mountain lion. Uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility and, and help a lot with the held out, with the holdouts and, and all the interaction and all that. Uh, another challenge that we had is, is um, obviously the show is was shot in anamorphic, so we um, and there was a lot of different formats and different cameras, which is great. Um, uh, so we needed to be flexible as well. I mean, we needed to, to uh, we need we need all our scripts and, and, and our pipeline to match the needs of of every single shot. And so we created basically uh, a bunch of tools in you to match, I mean, to, to help with um, anamorphic uh, artifacts and, and stuff like that. Um, obviously, we PG Boki, that is uh, one of my favorite tools for, for the focus because it, it's, it, it's really good, especially it works very well um, in anamorphic. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think those were the, the biggest challenges, probably, yeah. There's a couple of shots with the cub that um, I'm going to let you tell me whether they're real or digital or a bit of both. Because all I can think about, and I need to tell everyone listening and you guys here now, I'm a bit obsessed with stuffies. Like I've got a bad <laughs> problem with stuffies, you know, in visual effects. And I was wondering if Kevin Hart was just holding a stuffy or whether there was a real cub on set. And then if there was a real one or whether there was a stuffy, 
in compositing, did the real one then help you inform the digital shots and vice versa? Do you want to talk about that a bit, Jorge? Yeah, I mean, so the fact is that uh, the fact that surprised many is that we they, they had a real one in on set. So there's a couple of shots where where is uh, where Kevin Harris actually holding a real uh, um, cab of mountain lion, and and we did the mix in a couple of shots, obviously where where the, where the mountain lion is is uh, steady, but it helped us a lot to have that reference in comp as well, uh, uh, because obviously I mean the the all the all the um, black levels, so the uh, the interaction with the dust, um, even the 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 lot of brightness on on the eyes and, and all the features that the mountain light had. I mean, the, you could see the real one. How, I mean, how how the light was was uh, affecting all those features on on the real one, and we obviously match that as much as uh, as we could. I'm going to come back to Chris for a second, just in terms of um, an animation question. Um, like I said, I was, which is when Kevin's really grappling with the mountain lion. And I sort of want to ask each of you about how that, you know, presented any particular technical hurdles, but just in terms of animation, Chris, like how did you even tackle that? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> never easy. These kind of shots, that's, uh, that's the start of, starting point, I think. And, um, yeah, obviously at the big blue stuffy, so <clears throat> you had a rough, placement but it was just like a, a roll so there's no like you know head or, or hands mm. or anything on it so it's roughly i think to the right weight which i think really really helps if you get these things to the right weight at least it will feel correct when it's on top of them um but there's yeah it's it's hard especially if, if he's, he's grappling him because you need to have that interaction and you need to feel like the mountain lion's touching him uh as well he, you know he, he rolls the mountain lion off him so uh yeah, there's there's lots of tricky parts. Um, since the stuffy didn't have any legs, uh, we had a lot, uh, you know, a few issues just where to put the the legs on the mountain lion because you know it needed to be on top of him, you know, so he'd probably be on his shoulders. But then obviously Kevin Hart's kind of arms cross over, and then if they did that, then the mountain lion's legs are going through his arms. So we had to then choreograph kind of steps for the mountain lion to kind of avoid. Kevin, um, we did have full match moves, which is really good of the shots. So, you know, we have full 3D Kevin Hart, which is great to work with um, on all the interaction shots. So in 3D space, we could see where he was at. Um, and then we could kind of animate around that. You know, obviously we can't change Kevin Hart's performance, but we can change the mountain lion. So we're trying to figure out what's going to feel most believable, what looks, you know, tangible and, and realistic, but, you know, by avoiding uh, all the common problems that will come with that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not an easy task. I think those, the uh, the interaction ones are always the ones that take the longest. Mm. So, uh, yeah, when I saw the, the rough script and the storyboards and things like that, I'm like, yeah, these are the ones that we're going to have to dedicate a lot more time to. And I think they were probably the last ones we finished on the sequence. So Right. N Neil, when you see in the script or previs or post-vis that kind of interaction type shots, which involve, yes, all that match moving work, obviously in intricate comp work but then cg lion and i'm guessing maybe even some cg dust and things like that like i'm just curious about what do you see on the page and what things go through your head knowing that you have to solve yeah. i think um yeah you're right it was like match move getting the match move bang on and we had richie hoyle he did a really good move really good um job on that stuff i think the problem we had sometimes was the actual stuff with our head on set probably wasn't the same width or as the lion so there were shots where he's rolling down the hill and we're, we've got like a lidar scan of the mountain and then we've got the match move but there's very little space underneath kevin hart to fit the lion when he's rolling over and over again so we had to do a little bit of um sort of bespoke stuff for that um yeah we had effects uh we had effects dust and ground interaction for all the shots that the that the that the lion was like obviously interacting with the ground so that was quite a big overhead because I think we did sort of individual um, bespoke sims for probably about 20, 25 shots, I think, in the end, um, which would be, you know, full ground interaction. We had like bits of debris as well. And then we had the, the puffs of smoke, um, which again relied on animation hitting certain points on the on the ground. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just it's just for me, it's trying to work out all the elements we need to get ready to build the shot up and then not, you know, you kind of have to have them all in a good place at the same time. 
time to be able to then get them rendered uh, and sent to comp and also give the comp guys enough time to to then layer these all up as well and then give us some feedback if they need anything else or what sort of mats or AOVs they might need as well. So there was then a more collaboration at that end of the show where we had the effects and the lighting and there was a lot of feedback about obviously deep was a big thing, uh, getting the correct AOVs, getting the correct look for the dust and everything. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to get all, it's just trying to get all these shots up to the same level and then again, level them up again afterwards with the effects and then level them up again in comp so it's just uh yeah it's all just i think it's just a case of layering shots up bit by bit to make them better and better and better and can i also ask about that crazy close-up uh to camera leap that the um mountain lion makes and maybe coming back to you hirsch just in terms of modeling some of that insane detail of the tongue teeth uh inside the mouth i thought that was very impressive and Bastian already mentioned it as well, but I just thought you might want to mention a few things more about the modeling there. Yeah, I mean, we had to, again, you know, go through all the references of real references of inner mouth, and we had to sculpt everything. Uh, the cats have this fur on their tongue that was actually quite challenging. We knew that we've got a shot, which is, you know, right in the mouth. So we actually had to sculpt uh, the fur on the tongue as well, which, you know, but, which was rendered in the look there. So we had to go all nitty gritty details. Their gums have a lot of, you know, a uh, meaty bit. We had to sculpt all that stuff. Uh, they have this flap as well on, on their lower gum where the bigger tooth uh, sits in so that the lower gum doesn't get hurt. So we had to model all that stuff in. I mean, yeah, it's all, all you know. And also I had to actually mention that uh, we did sort of uh, accurate facial uh, expressions as well. So modelers would actually do it. So I had to sculpt all the facial expressions, which are actually scientifically based on uh, something called FACS, Facial Action Coding System. So uh, there's actually paper on cat facts as well, which we, we were lucky to find because the human face muscles are slightly different to the, to the cats. So we actually, I had to sculpt those facial expressions as well, like snarl, you know, nose, you know, nose dilator and stuff like that, which then would go to animation and they would animate to, you know, give that realistic effect. So all that stuff, we were really focused onto the face to make sure the expressions are right, make sure the details and displacements are right, the tongue fire is right, you know, so that if there is a shot like that between you, it looks right. Also, we did shot sculpting as well, didn't we? Yes, and we did the shot sculpting as well. So short sculpting is the process which is after uh, the, the animation and after the CFX. So Ziva would do its magic, but there would always be, you know, tricky, tricky bits where, you know, the model is turned a bit too much or the, you know, the interactive, even the interactive shots with Kevin Hart, I think, you know, those were very demanding. So this is where shots got from there. Exactly. Came in really handy because sometimes the mountain line would get in some pretty questionable poses and would do the best that we could, but then Hirsch was like the get out of jail free card kind of thing. <laughs> so it worked as magic. Uh, made everything look yeah, lovely for us. So but. short sculpting is, yeah, like the last sort of uh, bit, you know, fill in the chain, basically, you know, everything that comes after CFX and there's some issues and we would just go frame by frame, well, not frame by frame, but every 10 frames, and then we would sculpt up the muscles. Maybe some, it needs a bit of attention where the Ziva didn't really do its job, and, you know, we just add a bit of tension and stuff, some interaction. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, you know, modeling is, I mean, build is basically from the beginning of the process to the very end, really. I'm so glad you mentioned that there's such a thing as cat facts, because a few <laughs> years ago I covered a wolf-related um, show where they talked about some dog facts and yeah. now I love that there's cat and dog facts. Like then, you know, there's a rivalry between cats and dogs with facts as well. <laughs> so there it's actually team facts, team facts as well, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. there's, there's actually, cause the thing is, I mean, you know, the facts, the way facts works is, as you know, is, you mm. know, for human, you know, the idea is if we can do every expression that our facial muscle can do, and then give that to the animator, then they would be able to, you know, pose the face in what what uh, what realistically is possible. So if we can do that same thing with the animal, you know, then we would be able to achieve every sort of expression that a real living, uh, you know, animal or a human can do achieve. So, you know, yeah. it's more real, uh, it's as close as real. Awesome. And Kevin, I want to make sure that I give a shout out to the texturing work inside the mouth and the, this close up face. Um, you know, as, as Bastian had already mentioned as well, but do you want to just talk about some of those texturing challenges within the face, tongue, you know, inside the mouth, which it must last for five 
hundredths of a second, but it has to be right, right? To otherwise you would you wouldn't wouldn't be so proud of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we uh, can argue with any creature in any uh, in any TV show or film. The face is going to be the, the main feature. You need the eyes. You need the, the granular detail to really sell the work. Because overall, holistically, when you work to the finer details, things will look more organic. So it just took, just like Chris would with, with his animation and looking at reference videos for mountain lions, I would do the same on Google, just looking at images of lions, mountain lions, National Geographic photos. So they usually take photos of animals in good studio-like conditions. So I would just observe all of these internet references, compile them into a mood board, and so show my peers and show um, and showed them at daily sessions to see what kind of mood uh, people would like to see of the uh, of the features, and it just goes into um, then the texturing phase, which was probably for the mouth probably took me about two about two two to three weeks just working on just the teeth, the tongue, and the inner flesh, and just looking at where uh, the coloration of where the pink flesh starts and where the kind of leathery melanie melanie and uh, melanin type mm -hmm. of flesh uh, starts and really getting the uh, skin detail which would which would help from uh, displacement in, uh, sculpting phase so they'll have like wrinkles in the, in the flesh and then for texturing i would provide a more high frequency skin like texture and for the uh the wet the wet look that would be I'll be painting that specular detail to make to make it look wet and uh, put a lot of visual interest where, where like the, the lights will kind of shine on the teeth and that will help with the subsurface and the, and the look good, which would, yeah, and then all of my textures would be passed on to look good for them to work there. <laughs> right. And, and actually, Bastian, I was going to ask you about that um, in terms of look dev whether um you mentioned i think you mentioned arnold was the renderer here um yes. i i was always curious in the pipeline whether you have to like send those out to arnold to see how it works or whether you to see if it's working i mean or whether you have sort of some sort of other preview that you can rely on i guess what i'm getting at is the time taken to get a good look at this, what is a complex CG creature, right? Um, well, we don't have um, any previews, so we always have to render um, locally first. But yeah, with a fur and especially ET, yeah, you have different options to reduce the number of uh, airs actually uh, render. So for the preview, um, yeah, usually we reduce it by 10 maybe. Uh, because when we render the old cat with all the fur description, we are talking maybe about millions of uh, hairs in total. Mm. Um, it's quite heavy to render, especially on the memory side. But yeah, for preview or quick render, uh, yeah, we reduce the number of hairs. And uh, usually, yeah, we can uh, work this way. Um, we can get uh, feedback after. Even two or three minutes, we already have a clear render. Um, of, yeah. But yeah, I think the um, most technical issue with fur is the memory. Uh, we had to increase the memory on a lot of machine <laughs> to make sure that everything was rendered properly. I do want to add one thing, and that's actually for Kevin and Matt, uh, who's not here, the groomer, lead groomer. There's this thing on, on the on the cats, right? On the lions and mountain lions. There's, this thing is very specific. It's the patterns that they have of the groom on their face, particularly. It it is it's dependent bit of the bit on the shape, underlying shape, but it's a lot to do with the directionality of the fur. And to nail that is absolute tricky. It is the most trickiest thing. So you know the color changes when you look at an image of a lion and there's color changes on the mm -hmm. face. Think that it, that's just you know the color change, but it's not. It's the directionality of the groom. And how it actually looks is it's a lot dependent on that. But as it's well. even the skin color underneath. So yes. what's interesting is that 
I, I was hoping Kevin would, would touch on this, but oh, yeah. the actual face of the mountain lion underneath all the groom is actually it's, it's a dark face. Yeah. So oh. it's quite fascinating. You'd think with a lighter skin or lighter groom color that yeah, it'll be light. yeah light yeah. skin, but it's the complete opposite. So when the fur is on a specific angle, you actually see exactly. patches of black yeah. on, on coming through, which is that's what I think works really, really yeah. nicely. Yeah. Just, yeah. So, just imagine a big slit. That's that's <laughs> what that's exactly. almost uh, lion. Because I we never saw like uh, uh, we never see these cats without fur. Yeah. So I had to look at references of lions because most of those have uh, they shed their, their fur, so they, they, they kind of turn like scar. A, you can yeah. see through the scar. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. They kind of turn that's brownish, awesome. like a brownish. And I think pink. mountain lions as well. We discovered are like they they're more like cats than than the like lions. the large cats in their behaviour. So they're the, they're the, the largest cat that that. Meows, aren't they? Or I birds? think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was almost yeah. like, yeah. So yeah. sometimes we were, you know, any sort of steer to make it more lion-like was, you know, let's steer it back to being more cat-like. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing was on they actually shot the, they cast the mountain lion, they did the scan and they actually brought the mountain lion on set with a with the hope of being able to get the mountain lion to do some stuff on camera. So the idea was, I think originally our shot count was a bit smaller and, you know, they tried, but they couldn't get it to do what we wanted. So then that kind of expanded our shot count. And and I guess the one good thing about that is we didn't have to actually uh, directly go, uh, our mountain line, what, it matched the, on, the onset one, but you can never see the onset one on camera. Whereas with the mountain line cub, yeah. We had direct cuts mm-hmm. between our CG one and the mount and the and the, the live action one, which which made that a lot trickier. But we managed to do that in in a quicker turnaround because we we reused a lot of the topology muscle systems that we did for the mountain line. We could then retarget for the for the cub, which was like a nice efficient way of running that side of the project. I think um, I was going to add as well just the shot of the cub getting thrown. Um, <laughs> oh we, yeah. We looked- um, obviously, finding reference of something getting thrown is, is always really problematic. So we ended up finding these really cool references of uh, cats getting thrown across, not thrown, but like pushed. And they really enjoy it, but they uh, across kitchen floors and they skid out and then they come on back. So we kind of used that as reference because we wanted it to look uh, unheard. So, you know, he had to land, uh, hit the ground and then get up as quick as possible and shake his head to make it feel like he wasn't injured. So by finding these funny references of, of all things, like a cat skidding across a kitchen floor, kind of was relatable to what we needed from the performance. So we tried to keep it as grounded as possible, but there were a few exceptions from time to time where you had to kind of go and find another bit of reference that was applicable. So. That, that this has a bad one. <laughs> no. not, not my cat. I, I was the one <laughs> throwing. Kidding. I'd never do that to cats. Cats are amazing. <laughs> the animator, no, yeah. <laughs> that's a great justification for watching tiktok at work i think with those sorts of videos <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's so much stuff we're watching that yeah it's uh, i'm getting paid for it so it's great <laughs> <laughs> wow it's such a great sequence and i'm so glad to go into a bit of depth about it um maybe just my final question and maybe neil this is something that suits you is this something that you guys are able to do remotely or had you got back to the office um, I think it's incredible the kind of work that Visual Effects Studios managed to pull off during COVID um, in work from home. But um, maybe Neil, you can speak to how the team actually yeah. delivered uh, we, this. We started the project um, in October 2021. So we were all working remotely then. We didn't get back into our new office until March this year. So, uh, and uh, we delivered the show in June. So we really only had two months in the office. And even then we were in the office in a very hybrid style. So um, some of the artists were in, some were remote. So as a result, we kind of worked pretty much like we were remote all the time. Um, We had, we were dealing with Netflix in LA as well. So there was a bit of a time difference and all their meetings and, and dailies with them were remote as well. So, I mean, I guess essentially the whole, whole show is pretty much done on a remote basis until right towards the end when we could actually get in the studio and i think the first time we saw 4k um renders projected in our in our screening rooms like, oh wow this looks really really good because <laughs> i've only been watching on a on a hd monitor up until then um so that was a nice surprise but yeah it was it was it was remote and hybrid to be honest and um you know the way we've been working 
thus far it, it hasn't really affected any of us and we're all kind of used to that way of working i guess it's the, it's the new the new way of doing things mm. Well, congratulations. Um, I feel like you really worked on the standout sequence in the film, all of you, and um, so great to chat about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.